Hello and welcome to this podcast, uh, which is on the subject title, Has the Psychological Contract Changed? My special guest today is Lucinda Carney, and she's the CEO of Actus, which is a performance and talent management software provider. But more importantly, perhaps for this subject area, she's also a chartered psychologist. She's an author and an expert, again, on the subject of change management. Um, She is also a significant uh, podcaster in her own right, um, running the hugely successful HR Uprising podcast, and she's got much more podcast experience than I have. So uh, hopefully she'll forgive um, some of the errors that I may make in this podcast with her experience. But anyway, Lucinda, it's great to have you uh, uh, with me today to discuss this really important and interesting subject area. Now, some people may know what the psychological contract is. And that's the psychological contract between employer and employee, just to give it a little bit more colour to it. Perhaps if, if I could kick things off, maybe you could explain to me what your understanding of that psychological contract is between employer and employee. Sure. Thanks, Nigel. Thank you so much for having me. Um, yes, so it's a, it's a term that's been around since the 60s, and I think it's evolved over time. But what makes it quite interesting is the fact that it's not explicit like a paper contract. Um, so it refers to, as an employee, my expectations, my beliefs, um, really my, my what I believe that an organisation should have to deliver for me. So it's my expectations from my organisation. And um, it might be something that I... I see it as something that it might be explicitly de- um, defined in terms of my pension or, um, or you know benefits or my performance management um, expectations, uh, or it might be implicit, and that's where it becomes quite tricky because sometimes uh, people perceive the way others are treated, whether it might be perceived favoritism by a manager letting somebody pre-pandemic work from home, um, or whether it's something about people having different working hours or uh, different reward. So all those sort of things, it's where people might assume something about the psychological contract, and it's often how they see it being displayed to those around them. And, uh, and I think that's where some of the, the trickiness comes along, because it's about my idea of perceived fairness and trust. To what extent we all want to have trust with our organisation and we need to feel that um, the treatment that we get is, is fair relative to others. And that's where things become a little bit murky, I think. And uh, my, my view is that the pandemic has definitely had an impact on that because the psychological contract has evolved um, without HR being able to control it or managers being able to control it, its circumstances have caused it to evolve. You can't necessarily rewind. So we need to work yeah, out where no, we are absolutely. now. And, and, and obviously, you know, going back to the title, and it was important, thank you for that really good description of what the psychological contract is. Um, going back to the title in terms of it, its change, and of course, most people will immediately have uh, picked up on what you said that, you know, the, the pandemic, pandemic's changing lots of things, isn't it? And, uh, or, or maybe it's amplifying or, or um, exaggerating things that have already been there. What do you think, you know, you, you mentioned working from home being an example, you know, what other examples can you think of where this contract, psychological contract has changed? And, and and as I say, is it is it that it's actually because of the pandemic, or do you think the pandemic has just exacerbated or maybe speeded up things which were naturally evolving in that direction anyway? Oh, yes, I think the answer is yes, <laughs> in terms of both of those, probably. So uh, in terms of the major change that I would see where the psychological contract has evolved is about the... It's broken the paradigms about where we can work effectively. So historically, many businesses liked to control where we worked because it was convenient to them because we had these offices and it was because what we'd always done. And line managers felt that if they could see you, they knew you were working. And there was a a paradigm that for us to be productive, we have to be in an office um, to a large extent, not not always, or we have to be in an office a significant portion of the time in most cases, the majority of people are perceived to do that. 
Now, many people if, uh, wanted, have wanted flexible working. That's been a driver for some time. So to your point of whether this was coming anyway, it was something that people were selecting roles, particularly uh, the generation that's coming into the workplace or has come into the workplace over the last 10 years. They wanted more greater work-life balance. Those are the sort of things that they were electing for in terms of roles that they chose. But HR's role traditionally, well, it's about maintaining fairness. And fairness was about treating everyone the same, I think, uh, treating everyone consistently and having policies. So we would have a flexible working policy and certain roles could or couldn't be. And it was based on something separate to the person. So fairness has become more open to interpretation. And when the government, and, and, and if I had come, let's say I'd gone and asked if I could work remotely three days a week, the sort of answer that might have come back and the reason a flexible working request might have been rejected might have been because it would be setting a precedent for other people and that we can't be productive and we can't innovate. Um, all of these are perceptions uh, in that sort of environment. Now, when the government told us all to stay at home, that threw this out. Suddenly, the paradigm shifted. We had to learn to be productive in a different environment. And because this has now gone on for a significant portion of time, we've got 18 months now, really, aren't we? Maybe not slightly longer. Uh, productivity hasn't gone down for many businesses. Uh, innovation hasn't gone down. There are certain things that uh, people working remotely have been affected in terms of career, career opportunities for certain roles. There are certain things in terms of getting people up to speed and learning quickly, particularly people who are early in their careers. But the whole idea that you have to be in an office in order to be productive has gone out of the window. So what that means is where businesses want their people to come back in, the, whereas previous, it's really shifted the contract is that people would feel they're having something taken away from them now as opposed to uh, them getting the benefit of flexible working. So it's tricky. The power balance has, has swung. And, and, yeah, I, and I think that, that makes think it very, that, very difficult. Yeah, that piece is, I think, for um, you know employees that are in an organisation, that feeling that they might have something taken away I mean, think about it. I mean, you're a psychologist, so you know a lot more about these things than I do. But if you, if you think about the psychology of that, the idea of having something that you value removed, um, even though you didn't have it 12 months ago, is really, really significant. And I think this is one of the things that employers and people in HR, a lot of whom will be listening or, or, or viewing this, will really have to consider that. And then it becomes a question of balancing, doesn't it, between... You know, what are the benefits to the business, the benefits to the individual and, and how you make some kind of compromise between those two positions? Well, you might not need to make any compromise because the business might decide, hey, productivity has gone up. Uh, but but the, the, there may have to be compromises. I mean, you mentioned a, a, a really significant piece a second ago, which I've talked to a number of um, employers about, which is it's fine for those people, dare I say it, in our sort of age group I'm sure you're younger than me but um, in, in the in the sort of shall we say who've already had their professional training and they've moved through um, working from homes you know lots and lots of benefits but maybe for those people earlier in their career then that can be a big challenge and again that's where the psychological contract perhaps becomes um, equally important because perhaps for those people, particularly with what they've been through in the last year or so, maybe their psychological contract has been, you know, they, they might view it as being broken, mightn't they? So there's a there's a there's a challenge with that aspect as well, isn't there? I mean, what are your thoughts on that? Uh, do you think you mean it's been broken because uh, they've had to go and work at home and they weren't able to be given the development yeah. they expected? Exactly Certainly, the, the loyalty. Sorry. Yeah, you can see that the loyalty um, could have been affected by this. So I was speaking to someone who works for the big four consultancy firms and he was talking about people that there's been a uh, you're hearing now and then these larger organizations saying that they want everyone to go back into the office or go back into an office and he was saying that all the grads that were in London they had you know they're people who've been brought under the graduate development schemes who were in London in shared houses they have ended up going home they've given up their leases this amount of time on because why would they be spending money to be in these shared in these shared environments working from their bedroom sitting with a laptop on their on their knee and 
therefore they're now spread around the country. They're no longer commutable. They can't commute to Canary Wharf easily. And they've still got a job. Whereas when they took that job, it was implicit, whether it was explicit or not, I'm not sure, but it probably was explicit that you had to go into an office four days. It was just assumed that you'd be going into that office in, in London four, five days a week. These people are now in Liverpool, Manchester, Sheffield, you know, spread around. They've still employed. Where is the contract there? And the interesting thing in that is that the business, in theory, could expect them to go back in, but they're saying they haven't, they, they're not prepared to do that or not able or don't want to. They do have, this particular firm does have offices all around the country, so they could go into a different local office rather than the London one. But that just poses a really interesting dilemma. It, it smacks to me of a, a real swing in power. And uh, that's, that's difficult. I, I, I believe that links it into maybe if you look at what the solution is and also ties back to the question you asked me about whether this was coming anyway. One of the other things that I believe needed to come anyway and has been needed for, for a long time is a more people-centric approach. And this does go back to the fact that it's much easier if we're black and white. If we say, no, you can't do that because we're setting up, that would be setting a precedent and everybody's going to want to do that. Uh, that was the easy answer. Now we've flipped everything on its head as a business and we've demonstrated that actually to get the best out of people, we need to understand what motivates them. We need to understand uh, what makes them tick. And actually, if you are somebody who it makes all the difference, if you can take your child to school in the morning or you can go and work out and stable your horse or whatever it is that you might be able to do which you've been able to do over the last 18 months plus put in an eight plus hour day why would you want to take that away from people or why would people be prepared to give that back and it's just so difficult because it's grey and it requires a greater I think win-win contracting between the organisation the manager and the individual so we all need to be more adult to adult, whereas historically this power balance of no, you can't do it this way is quite a paternalistic, it was quite a parent-child contract that was in place that the business said, well, that's, you know, if you want to work for us, these are the rules, like it or lump it. Due to the pandemic, the pandemic it has flipped it on its head. People have demonstrated their, as far as they're concerned, they've kept their side of the contract. In many cases, They've gained work-life balance that they don't want to give up. They've maybe gained a bit less time commuting, uh, a bit less money commuting. There's various things, maybe a bit more quality time, etc. Some haven't. I think it's about 20% that want to go back in actively. But those who've, who've gained it, a significant majority have gained things. They're not going to want to give it up. Where we've got to be careful, though, and this is about careful negotiation, is that we help remind them that they have a responsibility to the organisation and to, let's say, they have a training role to the junior members of staff uh, to help them to be brought along, the, the, given some of the same opportunities that we were given earlier on in our careers where we got those development. And there's something about almost appealing to our responsibility um, and our commitment uh, is, is where I think we have to go to it. But we have to get people to choose to do it. We can't just instruct them to do it. I think a, a paternalistic approach is not going to get us very far. And that's why they're talking about things like the Great Resignation, because people are saying, actually, I now realise I can work from anywhere in the country, in the world. Uh, there are more jobs. There are more jobs available to me. So people with specific skills, a virtual environment has opened up job roles to them. So if we don't get people on board and get their buy-in, and, and sell an influence to them as opposed to dictate to them, uh, we as businesses will miss out. Absolutely. And I think the, uh, you know, you said about sort of win-win contracting. Um, I, I, when I'm coaching clients on, you know, the, uh, if you like, the strategic aspect of recruiting, then um, I always talk about looking for that win-win and, and respecting the applicant, even the, and, and, and even the applicants that they decline, is ensuring that they are treated with respect and that there is this, uh, again, it's a bit of a cliche, but there is this two-way street, the understanding that the good applicant has 
a number of different opportunities which they can apply for and potentially take and so therefore the employer needs to be looking at how do they make you know this this fits in then with employer branding how do they make their offering that much more attractive not only to you know again going back to employer branding not just to attract people in the first place but make sure that they retain them so in other words that that employee value proposition you know why why should i work for this company in the first place and then why should i stay and i think the really advanced companies and there, there are one or two that i'm lucky enough to do work for have really grasped that really understand it then they are able to actually um project that um to to make themselves more competitive because you know i'm sure you're aware of this but a lot of companies are still a little bit behind the curve on this that it's a buyer's market for good quality employees at the moment. So you need to do two things. You need to make sure that the ones you've got, you keep. So they're not, you know, people aren't approaching them and, and uh, persuading them to go. And the ones that you need to bring in, you need to make sure that you're getting the very best applicants by ensuring that they see that as a great place to work. And, and part of this flexibility, and I think also one of the other beauty, the beauties of once you've got your head around flexible working for your employees and trusting them to get on with it, is you mentioned earlier, you know, location. Why should they need to, you know, all, I mean, there's obviously going to be some people who need to be in a specific place, particularly if it's related to manufacturing or something like that. But a lot of people, even in manufacturing, don't necessarily need to be there every day. And it's a, it's a really, really interesting thing. So what do you think, um, you know, I've talked there obviously about some obvious benefits of getting it right. You mentioned policies earlier. Obviously, policy is a huge area for HR, you know, about ensuring that they have the right um, policies in place. How can they frame those? You know, how, how because obviously we talked at the beginning, the psychological contract is an intangible thing to some extent. But how can you frame policies around something that's intangible? What would you recommend to people? Yeah, so I've worked with a few businesses over the last 12 months about how you can do this. And I think actually a policy is is very top down. And when, when things are emerging, when clarity is emerging and the landscape is not clear, that policies are just a bit too cast in stone. So we need to have something a little bit more flexible uh, within reason if it's legal and things like this different. But what I recommend and what I've seen work well is you don't want to have nothing at all either. You want to have some level of clarity. So the businesses that have you know, sunk their heads in the sand and are just ignoring it, it as well, what happens with those is you get poorer behaviours in my observation, what, what, what I've noticed. So the ones that are talking to their people, so the answer I believe is to talk to people and collaborate with people and find out things like charters is a nice halfway house. So you might say, so what is our flexible working charter? What is our virtual meetings charter? What, what you know, it's, it's all it's agreeing win-win agreements. Actually, again, um, within team members. So do we on a first thing on a Monday morning? Does everybody have the camera on? I mean, okay, well, maybe not on a Monday morning, but our team meeting or training. Uh, does everybody have the camera on? Uh, yes or no? So I, I've worked with businesses and it's fascinating if you just take the virtual meeting etiquette where some of them you have got a 50% engagement, you can't see them, uh, they don't answer, you could ask them a question and they won't answer, so they're clearly doing something else, so it's presenteeism, that's not engaged. For me that's really dangerous. Or you've got people where they've got an etiquette, you come on, you're on camera, uh, you commit and you're involved in, in, you know, you put your hand up using whatever it is. So you've got different cultures that have evolved and the reality is a culture will evolve in those circumstances whether it's that or about flexible working or how we use video um, whatever it might be in terms of these new working work we don't you know coming in on Mondays and Fridays or whatever day of the week cultures evolve through behaviors right we notice each other's goes back to your implicit psychological contract so we notice that oh that you know the, the executive team well they're always doing their emails when they come on yeah, they're clearly not really listening to something. They don't. They they be, they're modelling a certain type of behaviour. Well, in that case, it must be fine for me to do that. So it's really about role modelling. I'm then making a judgment about what's acceptable behaviour, and this links into uh, the the behaviours that I now think are acceptable by my business. And if we want to change that or make sure that they are shaped in a positive way, I would encourage 
talking to people. How do we make this work? It's, you know, we might just try this for the next six months because for all we know, we might go into another lockdown or we'll all want to go back to the office, whatever it might be. But talking to people and saying, right now, what do we think acceptable behaviours are? Like you might set ground rules. If you are starting with working with a training group or a project team, say, let's just agree the ground rules that we're going to have for this purpose right now. It makes it so much easier then if somebody strays from them for us to go back and say, look, we agreed that our a ground rule really is a psychological contract. It's just one that's overtly agreed between a group of people um, and say, actually, we said we do this. We're not doing this. Let's go back to it. So for me, that's what I think we have to have regular conversations with people, include them, use the term we. How are we going to make this work? How are we going to help? How are we going to make sure we share ideas? Uh, how are we going to make sure that we can train up the new starters effectively and they don't miss out? What is it that we're going to do together to solve this problem? And, and talk and collaborate about it. And that's why I say you can have things like charters, ground rules, whatever they might be, which are just slightly defined, giving a bit of granularity or definition around these new evolving circumstances that we're in. If in 12 months time we go, actually that worked, that didn't work and it becomes a policy, fine. But the point is it's it's been... It's coming from the people, so they've bought into it, so it's not just being done to them, but it's also that little bit more flexible. So we're giving that clarity in a grey environment without being too too dictatorial when we don't actually know what the right answers are yet. Yes, yeah, as you say, I think the, a lot of um, a lot of good HR comes from consultation, doesn't it? And making sure that you've got the buy-in. I think also... One of the thoughts I had when I was thinking about this before we, um, uh, between the last time we spoke and and, and um, coming together today, I was, I was thinking, one of the interesting things perhaps with the psychological contract is that, your psychological contract very often isn't always completely with a company. It's with your with the person that I would call your hiring manager, isn't it? Or the, the person that you start working for, and and uh, uh, you're you're reporting to. And if that person changes, then sometimes the psychological contract is broken because of the fact that you don't you know, particularly like the approach of that individual. And that's how individual it can become, can't it? I mean, I suppose some of that, you know, it's a too big a subject to discuss now, but, you know, some of that is, you know, how to deal with change, I suppose, from the, from the individual perspective. But um, probably a good place to... To, to wrap up then is thinking about from a point of view of your you know psychological background you know what would you recommend to I and mean, we talked a lot about companies what they should be doing what about individuals how can they make sure that that psychological contract is um, fit for purpose for them but also that they're remembering that that psychological contract isn't just obviously you know just about what's in their interest but also in the interest of their team what would you what would you say to those individuals well, if you think about win-win agreements, okay, you can't, if one party is winning more than the other. So if I said, well, I refuse to go into the office, it's going to be the way I want to work it because it's all about me. If I'm selfish like that, basically, I'm thinking win, the company or my manager might be thinking lose. Long term, the business isn't going to be successful, I'll be out of a job. And if I care about my job, then that doesn't work. In the same way as win-lose the other way around doesn't work because I'll leave. So the adult thing to to bear in mind is that Everywhere requires give and take, a bit of flexibility. If I want to have a, a career, if I want to have a sense of belonging to an organisation, and that's quite a key area for people in terms of what do I actually like about this organisation? If I want to feel part of something, uh, then what do I need to contribute? What am I prepared to contribute? And what's fair for me to contribute? So it's it's about me thinking, what's, what are my responsibilities and what are my expectations and wants? And being prepared to discuss those, um, and, and ideally negotiate those. But we have to be prepared to give a little as well uh, as, as individuals because it's simply not sustainable unless we all want to go and work for ourselves, um, and, you know, which, which you know, not everybody wants to do. Then we need to think about the bigger picture. So selfishly, I might not want to ever go and sit on the underground again. In reality, part of my job role is to bring on new starters. So maybe I need to be prepared to go in five days a week, whereas previously it was 20 of, you know, tw sorry, five days a month, whereas previously it was 20. So what, what can I think of which is something which gives the organisation what they need, gives me what I need, and also the other people that I work with um, what they need? 
Fabulous. Well, Lucinda, thank you very much. Um, it's amazing how quickly our little time slot went there. Um, it's, a, it's a big subject and uh, we could probably talk about it for an hour or so and perhaps maybe we could come back to it or something related at a, another point. And, and uh, thank you so much. Uh, it's um, evident for uh, any of the people that actually have followed you know my podcasts um they perhaps ought to also uh, look at lucinda's now as well because evident from this conversation that um uh, really interesting subject area and and some really good perspective you've given us um lucinda on all of that uh, from a um, a really broad perspective, in fact, because not only, you know, being an HR professional, but also being a psychologist and also having your own business, a very successful um, business and, and running that and having uh, employees. So um, really broad perspective on this uh, particular subject. So thank you so much. Really enjoyed it. As I say, love to carry on talking, but uh, we do have a defined uh, time slot for these. Um, and then perhaps we can we can come back to it on, on another occasion. Anything else you want to, to, to mention just to wrap up at all, Lucinda? No, that's, I, I think it's something which is an evolving, ever evolving, but welcome. It's evolving in a welcome way, I believe. And if we capitalise on um, both as an organisation, if we go with it as individuals and organisations, then I think everybody can gain. Uh, it's when we fight against it and hold on to the old ways that I think possibly uh, that's not, not the ideal. So thank you very much for having me on, Nigel. It's a great pleasure and I hope that we're uh, able to do another collaboration in the future. So thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you for listening to or watching this podcast. Our guest was Lucinda Carney in conversation with me, Nigel Job. More information on Lucinda and her podcast series, HR Uprising, can be found on her LinkedIn profile. Other podcasts in this series can be found on our website, www.remtechtalent.com forward slash The Job Podcast and on The Job Podcast on Instagram. The series is also on audio version on Google Podcasts, Amazon Music, Apple Podcast, Spotify and Buzzsprout. I hope you've enjoyed this podcast and have a great day.